there, Kazan here, and welcome back to Always Doing. So apparently I don't get a break this week because my phone is actively trying to die on me and I'm gonna have to factory reset it. And if that doesn't work, guess who's in the market for a new phone? So before all of that, and while the camera, fingers crossed, is still working, I am going to record my most anticipated books for April. And today I'm gonna to try something a little bit different. Most months I give you fairly in-depth synopses of five or six books, and today I have 10 books that I wanna tell you about. And this is only half of the books I'm interested in this month. It's a really good looking month. And because there's so many books, I'm not going to get quite in depth about each one. Of course, as always, there will be links down below to each of the books on Goodreads, as well as anything else I may mention or reference. So well, please watch the video and then tell me what you think. Is, do you like this style better? Would you rather a little bit more information about each book as I describe it? Um, I'm just gonna try it this month and see how it goes. Usual disclaimers apply. This is the US publishing world, US publishing dates, which are of course subject to change and we will dive right in with First Responder, a memoir of life, death and love on New York City's front lines by Jennifer Murphy. It comes out April 6th from Pegasus Books. So we have a first responder memoir, more specifically a pre-hospital emergency medicine memoir. And I'm a huge fan of those. Love them. I've read a lot of books by people in ambulances and air ambulances and stuff. Uh, 911 dispatchers, definitely my kind of thing. And what I like about this one is that it's not just about the COVID-19 pandemic. She talks about becoming an EMT, the situation of EMTs in New York City. Turns out they get paid less than garbage collectors. And the dangers of the job, because you, you know, you're running right into the danger sometimes. And then also in the jacket copy says, through the night with the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, and we're not beyond it yet. But I think that means like through the worst part that New York City had near the beginning there. So sounds like just my thing. Also on April 6th, this time from Simon & Schuster, we have The Invention of Miracles, Language, Power, and Alexander Graham Bell's Quest to End Deafness by Katie Booth. Everyone knows that Bell invented the telephone, but uh, I don't think a lot of people know that he was an oralist and thought that sign language should not be a thing. And he wanted all deaf people to speak. And it's kind of amazing because he was born to a deaf mother and he ended up, his wife was deaf as well. But he, his like goal in life was to make all deaf people speak and to kill the language that is the foundation of capital D deaf culture. So I love that this biography takes a deep, hard look at that. I also love that it's written by a woman while not capital D deaf herself. She was born into a mixed hearing and capital D deaf family. So she grew up bicultural and bilingual. So I think that's great. That will give her great perspective into all of this. Then we have Prisons Make Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration by Victoria Law. It comes out April 6th from Beacon Press. This is part of Beacon Press's Myths Made in America series where they systematically dismantle all these myths. And this one, like it says, is about mass incarceration, the idea that, oh, prisons are fine, they just need a little reform and how that's not the case and how private prisons are the main driver of mass incarceration in the United States, which also not quite true and many other things. Super important issue. I have been reading more about social justice, but I haven't gotten to prison stuff yet. And this looks like a great starting point. Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Stories of the Founding Mothers of NPR by Lisa Napoli comes out April 13th from Abrams Press. NPR is national public radio in the United States. And when it started in the 70s, women were very highly discriminated against in journalism. I mean, even more than women are discriminated against now. And so these four women ended up playing a vital like foundational role in the network coming up off the ground. And so it's, I hope I get all these right. Susan Stanberg, Nina Totenberg, and um, Linda Wertheimer, and Koki Roberts. They all have very different, they're all white women. I gotta say, this isn't going to be very intersectional because I think they're all cisgender, heterosexual white women, but they all come from different backgrounds and they all, like some of them, Nina Totenberg became one of the most important influential Supreme Court reporters who like reinvented reporting in the courts. And I love that NPR has founding mothers. I want to learn more about these women, some of whom I have been listening to for a very long time. 
And yeah, and Napoli knows a lot. I think she's in public radio. She has lots of connections within public radio. So yeah, this is something I'd like to learn a little bit more about. Next is the Diné Reader, an anthology of Navajo literature. It comes out April 20th from University of Arizona Press. It has bunches of editors as well as bunches of different people obviously contributing content to this anthology. I there apparently there hasn't been a book like this yet which is kind of unbelievable because the Navajo people and in the jacket copy they use Navajo and Diné interchangeably so I will as well but the Navajo people have a very rich literary tradition so this book has a bunch of things written by Diné writers it includes poetry nonfiction fiction as well as a forward and it sounds like um, context to help readers who aren't as familiar place all of this in its rightful place in literary history. So I'm fascinated. Also on April 20th, this time from AK Press, we have Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse by Shane Burley. I don't know Burley in particular, but the um, foreword or the introduction was written by Natasha Leonard, who wrote a book about essays that I read kind of recently. And if you've been following the channel, you know that I've been reading a lot about fascism this winter, and this has been my goal. This falls right into that. I don't know much more than that, but I don't need to know much more than that. Okay, that was a lot of nonfiction, but fear not, that's the end of it. It's all fiction out from here. For some reason, all the fiction I'm interested in is all released in the second half of the month, starting with In Deeper Waters by F.T. Lukens. It comes out April 20th from Margaret K. McEldery Books. It's YA and it's fantasy and it's also queer. So we have a sheltered prince and he hasn't really been allowed to do much exploring or anything, but he's finally gotten to the point where they say, okay, you can go on your adventure, go see, it feels kind of like in Europe, like go see the continent kind of thing. And so he's on a ship starting his journey and they come across a, another ship that's like disabled, it's having problems or whatever, and they save a prisoner from that ship. And so this prince and this prisoner end up having a real close connection very quickly but the prisoner then jumps overboard and he's like, oh, well, that that ended quickly. That sucks. He's a bit heartbroken over it. But when he gets to land, he sees that guy several days later. No problem. So he's confused. It turns out that the prince has some magic stuff going on that he's trying to keep secret. This prisoner guy obviously has some stuff going on and things will go from there. I love the promise of the cover and the promise of the premise. It looks soft and it looks fun and there's going to be adventure and yeah I'm here for it. Next we have Anne Goretta's first novel in 10 years although it doesn't feel like that to English speakers because her stuff has been translated more recently like super recently. Her novel Sphinx won the best translated book award. She had another novel that won awards in the original French. Anyway this one is in concrete. Like her other work it is translated by Emma Ramadan and like her other work it's being released by Deep Vellum. This one is on April 21st. And she is a member of the Ulipo, I think, I hope I'm saying that right, where it's very experimental relationships with language. And so apparently she does a lot with puns and wordplay here. The jacket copy says that she blurs the line between written and spoken language, which I think is super interesting because you think you can put spoken language on the page, maybe, page, maybe it's because the puns work that way. It must have been a hell of a thing to translate, but I love Ramadan, I know she'll do well with it. And yeah, that's, it sounds like fun. And I haven't read Deep Vellum stuff in forever. I can't keep calling them one of my favorite publishers if I don't read from them every once in a while. So here's one. Only two more books to go. I might be speed talking. Hope I'm not speed talking. If I am, if you ever have trouble understanding me, turn on the closed captions. I edit them myself. They are letter perfect, except for the typo that comes in. There's usually one a video, but still, anyway, distracted. We have next The Hate Project by Chris Ripper. It is number two in the Love Study series. It comes out April 27th from Karina Press. It's part of their Karina Adores line, which is queer category romance. The first book was The Love Study. I adored it. I'll have a link up here to my standalone review. I loved it so much, so I'm definitely looking forward to this one. Here we have Oscar, who we met in the last book. He is a grouch, and but his friends love him, So and we see in the last book that He's a grouch, but he also has a good heart. It's not, there's obviously stuff going on there. Somebody else we met in the last book was Jack and he's a bit of an ass and you can definitely see why these <laughs> character names happened. Um, and he just 
is quick with criticism, quick, quick with insults. And we see in the last book too that he's not a bad person necessarily, but there's stuff going on there too. So Jack ends up having to clean out his grandmother's house and Oscar is temporarily unemployed. And so Jack hires him to help him go through all the stuff in the house. And apparently by going through all that stuff, they're going to work through their things and fall in love. And the last book, I will be able to keep the most succinct because I can sum it up in pretty much one line, at least to my satisfaction. It is A Wolf in Duke's Clothing by Susanna Allen. It comes out from Sourcebooks Casablanca on the 27th. They have given me an advanced copy. Thank you. I am going to be picking it up very, very soon because it is a historical paranormal romance that appears might have fated mates. And do you really need to know anything else? So there we have it, 10 books, 10 whole books I'm looking forward to in April. Please let me know if this format worked for you. If you would rather longer synopses of everything, let me know about that. If this is good, let me know about that. Anything at all, let's have a gab down in the comments below. And as always, leaving it an emoji is also an option. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new and I will see you in the next video. Bye.